Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you today. Um, unfortunately for you, you're going to have me twice today. Um, so I'm going to focus this uh, presentation very much on uh, one of the projects that we've been involved in, which is a JISC uh, project, which has been looking uh, and delving into a lot of the issues and problems and challenges around how you actually do some of this and how you particularly link between data in repositories and data in journals because, uh, and, or the journal publication uh, because it's qu actually quite complex. Um, I'm very briefly going to talk about you know, why sign published, but I think you've actually had a very good overview just now from Jason and also yesterday. And I'm going to talk about the prepared project and the three core aspects of it. I'll briefly talk about what we're doing with F1000 research uh, and moving beyond data only journals because f Research is a, a general journal, if you want to call it that. Um, but we insist on having the data behind those articles and then talk about some of the key challenges. Uh, and I'll be talking this afternoon more about f Research and, and some of the other core aspects around it, around peer review. So I will whisk through this. So why cite and publish data? There's increasing pressure from governments uh, to make data uh, from publicly funded research available for free. And obviously the public want to know scientists have been doing, uh, and funders want reassurance that they're getting value for their, their money. Um, scientists want attribution and credit for their work, and particularly where you're working in a data-intensive area, it's very important that you get credit for the data as well as, as the publications. Um, and by publishing and enabling the citation of the data, it enables and encourages, or can help to encourage, um, uh, researchers to, oh, sorry, uh, get that one, uh, to uh, actually submit uh, the data and submit it in a format and in, with the metadata uh, that you can actually use it. And of course, the important thing is that it enables people to use, reuse data, investigate the quality, look at reproducibility, all those kind of issues. So I wanted to talk about uh, the prepared project. So this uh, is a JISC-funded project. It's Peer review for publication and accreditation of research data in the earth sciences mostly, um, but we're broadening out because um, our, our background is the life sciences. Um, so it's, it's led by the University of Leicester, uh, linking up with a couple of the major atmospheric research data centers, California Digital Library, uh, DCC and, and Reading, and it's a, a Wiley uh, publication. Um, and it runs, it's a, one of the one-year uh, projects that runs to the end of June. So obviously the initial focus is on the launch of a data journal in the earth sciences called Geoscience Data Journal, but we're on there to look at how we broaden out what they're discovering and learning to other areas and to the life sciences so we can maximize uh, the output of the project. And there are three core areas that we've been focusing on. The first is looking at uh, workflows and cross-linking between journals and repositories. The second one is about accreditation of repositories. And then the third one, uh, which I've been particularly involved in, is the peer review of, of data, or even just scientific review of data. Um, peer review has its own specific terms. Um, and looking at the response, uh, the, the, the division of responsibilities between the repository and the journal. So I'll start talking about the workflows. So one of the things that the project did is take a number of, of uh, data repositories and a number of journals and look at the workflows and look at how similar or otherwise they are. And of course, as I guess you might expect, uh, they're very, very varied between the different repositories. And what makes it even more complex is you often have different workflows within one data center. Uh, and it often depends on who it is that you're interacting with. So you have the few engaged submitters that really understand and care about the data and, and are thinking about the issues around it. You have the vast majority who are dumping it and, and just say, you deal with it. And then you have those that want to use it and take the data out. From the journal side, obviously, what you need to do is minimize the effort uh, for the authors, um, partially to get them to do it in the first place, but also if they've already submitted data and metadata to the repository, you clearly want to make the most of that and share that information with the journal. Uh, and the other advantage, of course, is if you make a change in that metadata, you want to do it in one place. So we were talking yesterday about having a DOI and actually having several different versions uh, in reality. Uh, you've got to you know, try and avoid that. So if you make a change, it gets propagated throughout the others. 
Uh, so there is actually a workshop coming up about that, about looking at the cross-linking. So if it's something you're particularly interested in, it's coming up at the end of the month, uh, the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. So do let me know if you're interested, because I know there's a couple of, of places left on that. The second aspect is looking at repository accreditation. So uh, as a journal, uh, what you want to make sure is when you say to the author, right, you need to put it in the repository, you, you want to make sure they're putting it somewhere that's, that's appropriate, that's stable, uh, that's going to be there in 10 years, you hope, and 20 years. And um, there's a whole number of issues around um, accreditation of repositories. Um, and so, you know, questions of how do we know as, as journal editors and uh, whether the repository is trustworthy and how does the repository prove that they're trustworthy? Uh, and anyway, what does that mean? What are you actually checking for? And there's a whole mass of different things that you need to um, assess uh, to look at that and you need to look at the whole, whole workflow, essentially. And of course, what often happens with many of these things is we've got a number of repository accreditation schemes now, but of course, we've got several. So of course, now we have to decide which ones we're going to use, um, which obviously is an additional challenge. Um, but some of the key things that are essential, really, are obviously the data in there has got to be persistent. It's got to be permanently identified, uh, provided with a landing page with uh, metadata, standard publication metadata, and there's got to be uh, information about how you access it and how it's licensed. Um, that we, the project had a workshop discussion um, in January about that, and there's a report that's going to be coming out pretty soon. And then the third aspect is looking at data review. Um, and this actually spreads broader. It's, it was part of this project, but we broadened it out because uh, review of data actually occurs even right at the beginning when you submit, you know, increasingly funders are asking for data management plans. And they're now thinking, okay, we have to get these reviewed. So, you know, what do we need to be asking our reviewers to look at? What are the issues? So there's actually quite a bit of overlap there with also when the data goes in a the repository, then there's, there's varying levels of curation and review done at that point. And then when the article's published, there's obviously review, and particularly with more and more data journals and journals asking for the data behind the articles, there's review then. How do all those link together and how do they feed back to each other? So there's a whole issue, which is what we wanted to tackle in this workshop. And so what we did is we pulled together the five major stakeholder groups, so researchers, funders, institutions, repositories, and publishers, and it's now under this big umbrella group as well, the Research Data Alliance, um, to discuss um, specifically those aspects. Um, so we brought in um, uh, the MRC uh, was uh, included in that as, as one of the co-organizers to help us bring in that funder perspective as well. And the three aspects were looking at the connection between data review and data management planning, connecting scientific and technical review and curation, so the links between uh, the review at the repository and at uh, the article end, because of course, if you have somebody peer reviewing a, a, the data and they say, we think this data is really poor and it's sitting in the repository, there should be some link there somehow, and the question is, what is it and how does that work? And you know, but we need to start creating some of those links and thinking about how we deal with those aspects. And then connecting the data review with the article review within a journal. The recommendations are currently up for consultation for the next couple of months. It's bit.ly slash data PR for comment. And I really do encourage you to go and have a look. And particularly, those of you that are researchers in this, in this audience, I really would encourage you. You may think, oh, this isn't that relevant to me. But a lot of it is about, you know, we want to ask authors to do this. And we want to ask referees to do that. Well, that's you guys. So we need to know whether what we're, what we're suggesting makes sense. Uh, because what we want to do is at the end of June, we're going to pull all the feedback back together um, to formulate a set of recommendations uh, from that that we're then going to write up as a practice paper and try and encourage the stakeholder groups to actually implement. Um, by all means, feedback to me, but there's also this uh, JISC have set up a listserv, which is actually really useful anyway for anybody interested in data publication, which I'd encourage you to join. So moving beyond um, data-only journals, um, in more traditional articles, data sets are actually rarely published. And in fact, some journals, like Journal of Neuroscience, flatly discourages uh, publication data and refuses to have any supplementary files whatsoever. But of course, I, I would argue, without the data, what have you got, really? You've got to, as a reader, take it on faith 
that the data was collected and analyzed correctly. Um, it's often difficult to get the authors to provide the data afterwards, even when they've signed something saying they will give it to you. Somebody actually did a study and tried to contact about 400 pe uh, people who had signed to say they'd given them the data, and a very small percentage actually handed over the data. And of course, without the data, it's in pretty much impossible to use, reuse, replicate the information. And even those that do provide some of the data, it's often in supplementary files, it's obscure formats, you know, it's Excel spreadsheets that are now as a PDF. It's poorly structured because nobody's taken the effort to actually really explain what's going on. And the licenses limit computational mining and reuse. And so what we've done on Open Thousand Research uh, is actually make data submission mandatory. With obviously the caveats what we had uh, yesterday, that's Mark Walport, that there are some specific instances where that's not appropriate, and we fully understand that. But aside from that, we ask for all the data behind findings. Now, the interesting thing is uh, that, uh, like most authors, they generally don't read the author instructions, so of course they submit the article, don't realize they have to provide the data. And so the reason I'm saying that is that I think this is actually fairly, uh, isn't particularly a biased group. Oh. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and a small number, as you might expect, and it was a small number, raised the usual concerns. This is my first paper from this data. I want to publish others. I couldn't possibly give you the data at this point. Or I don't want somebody to scoop me until I've finished my own data analysis. Or there's too much confidential data. Um, or it's just too time consuming. It's only weeks to explain the data. Um, but despite this, when we explained why, and most importantly, the reason that really seemed to make the difference was that when we said publishing your data is going to give you priority on that data. If anybody wants to reuse it, build on it, find other conclusions from it, they will need to cite your data. They all have given us their data. All of those people have given us the data to go behind it for publication, for open access publication. So things that we do, it's obviously, uh, there's a number of things, and I'll, you'll become a little more clear when I explain our publication and refereeing model. Um, <clears throat> but we do a lot of pre-publication checks on the data. Things like, is there a proper re repository, a subject-specific repository that this should be placed into? And this is really important because we want to make sure we don't, um, <clears throat> by submitting the data into somewhere like Figshare, we don't decimate the other uh, subject specific repositories where a lot more effort's required um, to provide metadata. Are the formats appropriate, the layout, labeling, have we got enough data? Have we got enough protocol information? That's really important because if you haven't got detailed protocol information, you might as well not have the data because you don't know what it means and how it's created. If there is an existing repository, as Mark mentioned yesterday, we've been working with Figshare, um, you've seen this, <coughs> but what I wanted to sort of say is that some of the, the really useful things about um, using this is that you can preview the data within the article. You don't have to have the viewer yourself to be able to see it. Um, you can preview very large data sets. I think this one was 11 gigabytes. It just opens just like that. And you get things like usage information, and they get their own legends, DOIs, and you can independently cite the data itself. We then specifically ask referees to check aspects not to look at the refereeing the data itself, because I think that's largely impossible in the timescales required for peer review. Um, but looking at things like, are the methods appropriate for the question being asked? Has enough information been provided? Is the structure appropriate? Have they stated limitations of the data? Um, and in some cases, it may be possible to ha at least have a look at the data and have an idea, does it look okay? And of course, the ultimate referee is post-publication is reuse, those are actually trying to reuse it. So in conclusion, some of the key challenges I think we've got really are one of the things that the, it's a, I think it's going to be really important to have accreditation repositories because particularly when you publish across a very broad area as we do, it's very hard to know all the repositories out there and well, are they any good and how much um, curation do they do and all those kind of issues. Um, and so we need to work out a way of encouraging the accreditation of repositories. We need to build much stronger links between repositories and journals in both directions, workflows, review outputs, all those issues. We obviously, as we all know, need much stronger carrots to encourage people to share data. And actually, I would argue journals, and journals often say it's the funders, um, but actually I think journals have a, a big role in this, as we found out, actually saying we insist on having the data, people really will provide it. And we need better credit systems for the sharing, curation, and publication of data. So thank you very much.